today, Sunday, July 26th of the year 2020. And we will continue our discussion on our unit theme for this month, which is faithfulness. And uh, before we get into the discussion of the lesson, let us go to the Lord in prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, we come home this morning thanking you, God, for one more opportunity. God, as we stand before your people, we ask now that you give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we might rightly divide your word. God, we ask you to bless all those under the sound of my voice. God, that they may be able to receive what you have for us on this morning. We thank you, God, for sparing our lives. We thank you, God, for reasons of oceans of health and strength. And God, we just thank you for being alive, even in these troubled times. But we know, God, that you still got, and you still do what God does. So we thank you now. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Say amen and amen. Now let's get right on into our discussion on this morning. For our lesson topic is active faith as we continue our study on faithfulness, active faith. Lesson scriptures, James 2, 16 through 26, Romans 4, 18 through 22. Our key verse comes from James 2 and 18. And of course, we will be discussing that, elaborating on that verse as we go through our lesson today. The essential question for today's lesson, is your faith active, passive, wavering, or weak? That's the question. And we've been talking about some of these different types of faith as we went through our series of lessons on this month. So as you take that information that we've shared uh, and on what you have read in scripture and make a decision, a self-assessment of your faith and what type of faith that you, ha you have at this point. The lesson aims, what we uh, take away from today's lesson. At the end of the lesson, the participants should be able to learn and understand the difference between genuine faith and wavering faith Understand why faith without works is dead faith. Understand how faith is developed and strengthened. In our introduction to today's lesson, we find that the Bible has a lot to say about faith and the different levels of faith. And you've heard names such as common faith, genuine faith, great faith, and the one that we all hope to avoid, wavering faith. Christian faith is based on God's promise rather than feelings, circumstances, or the people around us. Christian faith is based on God's promise. And it says in the statement that it has nothing to do with our circumstances. So what that tells me is that our faith should be just as strong when we're going through things as it is when times are good because it doesn't depend on our circumstances. Our faith is not an emotional thing where we wave up and down depending on how we feel. Our faith should be constant. The one who truly believes and has faith will act on God's word with perfect assurance that his request will be granted. Now let's, let's, let's break this down because there's a lot said in that statement. It says the one who truly believes. And so when we're talking about faith, it tells us now that there is a connection between belief and faith. You will not have faith in something that you don't believe in. So it starts with the belief. Before you can have faith in God, you have to believe, first of all, that there is a God. Because naturally, if you don't believe in God, you're not going to have faith in Him. So it's belief, and the belief should lead to faith. And then it says if you have that belief and that faith, you will act on God's word with perfect assurance. And that word perfect in scripture, you know, means that it's complete. You have complete assurance that the correct requests that you make will be granted. That's the result of faith. Now, now it also points out there that the faith, you will, if you have faith, you will act on it. You will act on God's word. And we're going to talk more about that as we get into the lesson, but just keep that in mind. Now as we go to our exposition of today's lesson, the first thing we want to talk about is faith and works. And I want to take you to the second chapter of the book of James, 
verse 14 through 18, a portion of, the, of our lesson scripture from the book of James. And the question that I'd like to ask is, can you be saved through faith alone? And I'm asking the question and I'm using the book of James because James has already answered the question for us. And we're just going to go through. Those of us who were in our regular setting during Sunday morning before the pandemic, you knew that I had a tendency of ask questions, and then I'll try to help you find the answer to the question. So that's what James is doing in today's lesson. Can you be saved through faith alone? Let's start with verse 14, and I'm just going to give you the highlights from these verses, and I, as always, I encourage you to read the entire thing at your leisure during your study time or during your meditation time. But verse 14, it says, if a man says he has faith and not works, can faith save him? That's what James is asking us on this morning. If someone says that they have faith and has no work, can that faith save them? Now let's see what James says about it. Verse 15 through 16. He says in those verses that if someone is in need of food and clothing, and you say to them, peace be unto you, God bless you, and I'm going to add to that, I'll pray for you. His question is, and you do nothing about their physical need, what good have you done? You're saying, the, you're saying the right things, but the person is in need. And if all you do is just tell them these things, are you really helping them? Verse 17, said, so in the same way faith, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith, if not accompanied by action, is dead. And I'm going to use an example of uh, keeping the body fit and being healthy. If you have a treadmill or stationary bike at your home, and you say, you know, I have faith, I believe that these things, these apparatus are going to help me to stay fit. But you never get on them. You never walk on the treadmill. You never ride the stationary bike. But still you have faith. Have you accomplished anything? And I'm sure we all know what the answer to that. The faith has to be accomplished by some kind of action. Verse 18, it says, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now one of these things is possible, and the other is not. Again, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. First part, how can you show me your faith without works. It's just like the example above. You cannot show me that those things that we mentioned work if you never got on them and actually used them. So your faith is the same way. You say that you have faith, but I don't see any, any evidence. I don't see any evidence. We say faith is the evidence of things not seen, but there's, there's no evidence there. And so therefore, it's, it's not really faith. It is dead. As James said, which, uh, how do we show, how do we show our faith in God through our works? How do we do that? Well, there are several ways that you show your faith through your work. One is by following God's commandment. The other, trusting in him. And the third, living a godly life. Now, these are not all of them. But these are just some examples of how you show your faith. If you say you have faith in God, then we should see some of these things reflected in your life. For instance, when we say following God's command, God commanded us to do several things. For one thing, he commanded that we love each other. The great commandment, the new commandment, is that you love one another. So if you don't show love to other people, then you're not, showing, you're not displaying your faith in God. You're saying you have faith, but you're not putting that faith into action. Living a godly life. A life based on the examples of Jesus Christ. That we can do, say what Jesus said, do what Jesus did. That way, we are acting on our faith. And if we just say we have faith, and we're not doing anything, we're just sitting around talking, then that is not faith. And when James say faith without work is, is dead, it means that it is not effective. It is not effective. It's not benefiting us, and it's not benefiting anyone else around us. 
You don't have to have faith because of your works. But you, but you work because of your faith. You don't have faith because of your works. But you work because of your faith. Think about that. I'm going to let that sink in. The faith is what causes us to do the work. Now that does not mean that all good works are done through faith. Some people do good works, but it's just because they're a good person and they want to do the right thing. But if we do good works based on our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ, that's the kind of good works that we're talking about. And there will come a time when those works will be separated. The Bible says that your work is going to be tried by the fire to see what type it is. See, if you actually did good works for the right reason, or you did good works to benefit you or someone else, it will be tried in the judgment. Now let's go to another example of faith, and we're talking about active faith now. So let's go to, to another example, and we're going to go to another passage of Scripture, and we're going to talk about Abraham. And, and we're coming from Romans, the fourth chapter, 18 through 22 talking about Abraham, who was called the father of the faithful. And verse 18 of that fourth chapter of Romans says, Abraham, against all hope, believed in the promise that was spoken, even if he got to the point where he lost hope, because hope is temporal. We're talking about things of this world that we hope to have or we hope to accomplish or we hope to be. But it says he, he had faith against all hope, because he believed in the promise that was spoken. And that's what kept him doing what God instructed him to do. Because he had that faith. And he believed that God was going to do what he told him to do. Now we know what, what God told Abraham. It was not uh, a minor thing. It wasn't anything small. Because he told Abraham, who had gotten up in age, that he was going to be the father of many nations. And he didn't have one single child. And so in order for Abraham to believe in that promise, at his age, it had to be faith. Verse 20 of that same chapter said he did not stagger. And that, that's from the King James Version, the New International Version says he did not waver at the promise, but was strong in his faith. Earlier in this month, we, we talked about unfavoring faith. When we begin this discussion on faith, unwavering faith. And now it says here in that 20th verse that Abraham's faith did not waver. It wasn't up and down. It was continuous. He believed in the promise of God. Verse 21, he was fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he promised. He had to be fully persuaded. We mentioned this in our introduction. You do, do what you do, you take the action because you believe in the promise that God has given us. And if you know that he will never renege on his promise. Verse 22 says, because of his faith, it was credited to him as righteousness. Because Abraham had this type of faith, it was credited to him as righteousness because he was doing the right thing in the eyes of God. And verse 23, which is not included in those passages, but verse 23 says that this was not only for Abraham, but it was for anyone who believed in God and believed that Jesus Christ as his son was raised from the dead. If anyone believed that, that is going to be credited to you for righteousness also. And this is going to be something that when it comes time for the judgment and to leave this world, those are things that you're going to be given credit for. It's going to be accounted to you. And so faith is very important as we go through this Christian journey. Let's kind of summarize what Abraham do, did. Let's look at Abraham's faithfulness. Number one, he was willing to leave his home, most of his possessions, some of his friends and family, to go to a place that he did not know where he was going. That's faith. Number two, he believed God's promise that he would have a child in his old age. And number three, after all of that, he was willing to sacrifice his only child to God. After all that he went through in, in, in being blessed with the seed that was going to make him the father of many nations, he was still willing to sacrifice the child back to God. And you know the story of the child Isaac as Abraham 
was going up to make sacrifice to the Lord. And he told him to sacrifice the child. And Abraham, of course, was willing to do that until the ram showed up. But all of that is, is a great level of faith. And I believe we should call this active faith. Because Abraham didn't just say it. He did it. What kind of faith do you have? And you've heard many types of faith mentioned through, through this discussion. But I want you to listen to these three types and evaluate, do a self-evaluation as to which one of these faiths do you have. The first one is active faith. Active faith is when we put our faith to work by helping others and spreading the gospel wherever we go. James would call this work with faith. There's a result of our faith, spreading the gospel and helping others. Second type is passive faith. Now, now that word passive has a negative connotation because we think of passive as being non-aggressive and people will be able to take advantage of you and that type of thing. Well, that's not the kind of passive that we're talking about here. Passive faith is about waiting. It's about patience. It's about holding on when things get rough and times get tough. It's about receiving the strength you need to live a godly life in an ungodly world. So passive faith will cause you to wait when others may react rationally, irrationally, this type of faith will cause you to wait until God tells you to act. Sometimes he's, he's going to tell you that you just have to stay there, stand in place, and see the glory of God. And when the time comes, when the time is right, then he will tell you what you need to do and how to do it. But it takes passive faith to be able to wait on God. Like the book of Isaiah, wait, I say on the Lord. It takes passive faith to do that. The third type is genuine faith. Genuine faith is real faith. It's based on belief and conviction, not feelings and emotions, as we mentioned earlier. Genuine faith never changes because of circumstances, but it remains consistent. And the question was, what kind of faith out of these three, what kind do you have? Now, full disclosure, that should have been, I gave you A, B, and C. That should have been a letter D, because this is a multiple choice test. And letter D would have been what? Yes, all of the above. All of the above. And if you're a true believer, you will find yourself, you listed in all of these three types of faith, you will find yourself on this morning. So it should be all of the above. And if not, whichever area your faith is lacking, then you need to really go to God, you need to read the Bible, and you need to strengthen whatever area that you're weak in. There's something, as we come to a close of today's lesson, we have, uh, for those of you who uh, have been a part of our regular Sunday school discussion before the pandemic, we have in our, our lesson outlines that we have, we have a part of, the, at the end of the lesson, it says the lesson applied. And this usually contains a question or questions that you can take what we discussed during the lesson and apply it to your life. And one of the questions for today's lesson was, do you think you will ever get to the point where your faith never wavers? Now I want you to answer that question and to be honest with yourself. Do you think you will ever get to the point where your faith never wavers? And we talked about unwavering faith, and we talked about genuine faith, and we talked about weak faith. Question, self-assessment. Now, closing thought for today. Feed your faith, and your fears will starve to death. Think about it. God bless you. You pray for me, I'll pray for you. And we just let God be God. And we'll talk to you soon.
Praise the Lord. We give honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This morning, He is the reason that we are here. We're going to give Him praise. We're going to worship Him. The Bible declares that we can worship Him in spirit and in truth. This morning, we want to to give attention to the Gospel of Luke, in the 15th chapter, very familiar Gospel, the parable of the prodigal son, the lost son. We want to go to the 15th chapter. verse it says and when he had came to his senses he said how many of my father's higher workers have more than enough food and here I am dying of hunger I'll get up and go to my father and say to him father I have sinned against heaven and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your higher workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against him. And in your sight, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servant, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattest calf and slaughter it, and let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Praise the name of God. We want to talk from a topic this morning. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. Can we pray? Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you so very much for this time that you have blessed us to come together once again to preach your word in season and out of season. God, we ask that you allow us to decrease and you increase within us. That every word that comes out of our mouth shall not return void, but it should accomplish that which you have sent it to accomplish. If you lead us, we'll be led, and if you feed us, we'll be fed. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. There's no place like home. We've heard this term, we've heard this saying so many times that no place like home. And most of us and many of us that have heard the parable that Jesus, the story that Jesus, the illustration that Jesus was giving his disciples and those that were around him in his time of teaching, in the 15th chapter of Luke, he not only talked about the lost son, but he talked about the lost sheep, and he talked about the lost coin. When he began to talk about the lost son, the prodigal son, the one that came to his father and asked for his inheritance early, and he went out and he spent all of his inheritance. Many of you know the story that he found himself with nothing. He had spent all he had with living the way that he was living. The Bible even said it was righteous living. In other words, he was just doing exactly what he wanted to do, whatever his heart desired. He found himself not having anything left to where he had to actually go get a job. And the job he had was not the best job in the world. 
because actually it was that he was feeding swine. Got to the place to where even the swine that he was feeding was eating and he was hungry. The thing I like about in the scripture, it says that when he looked at the swine he, and he was hungry, it gave him a chance to come to his senses. And a lot of times, God give us a chance to come to our senses. And when he came to his senses, he thought about being home and how it was when he was home. And he said to himself, you know, I, I live better at home. Not only did I live better at home, but my father had servants at home uh, that's living better than I am right now. Uh, I can stay out here, let my pride keep me where I am, hungry, probably homeless, hurting, or I can get up and go home and just be truthful and tell my father that I'm sorry I've sinned against him and hope that he forgive me and he don't even have to reinstate me as a son but he can allow me to be a servant and I can live better than this. I believe we need to catch that because you know God has called us his friend. You know there was one time that the disciples considered themselves as his servants. He said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. But even a servant of God is in a great place, in a blessed place. When God bless you to where you can serve him and serve others, and I need you to understand, serving God is serving others. God said, uh, if you really want to show me that you love me, I can see that you love me by how you serve and how you treat others. The prodigal son came to himself and he said, you know, there's no place like home. I'm, I'm going back home. And we must uh, really understand that on his way home, the Bible says that his father saw him coming and his father ran out to him. He, he really didn't even have to go through everything that he had practiced within himself to, to get himself reinstated because his father was just so happy to see him. An indication of a real father's love is that a father is there for your protection. A lot of times that we read this passage of scripture, a lot of times that we tell the story, it's all about coming back home and reinstating yourself with righteous living. A lot of times we miss the fact that this was just a loving father because even the laws at that time the young man wasn't even supposed to receive his inheritance until his father had gone on to glory. But he gave him his inheritance early because he loved him. And I need you to understand something that, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with asking your father for whatever it is that you want. And your father have the right to tell you yes, or no. It amazes me because some people, some siblings, some children, they get upset and they'll say that there are certain children that are favorite children, favorite siblings, and, and, and could be so far from the truth. It is just that this young man went and asked for what he wanted. <laughs> and his father could have told him yes or no. His father decided to tell him yes. And it was his father right to say yes because it was his. <laughs> Praise the name of God. 
The reason I'm saying this is because when the young man came back home, he had an older brother, and the older brother uh, got upset because the father wanted to celebrate the young man. And the older brother is looking like, well, I was here the whole time with you. I didn't go out and live crazy, and I didn't lose everything. I was here supporting you. Uh, why, is you why are you doing this? And the father had to tell the older brother, and I always call him the other brother, praise the name of God. He had to tell the other brother that, listen, you was here with me and everything I had is yours. Uh, I, I didn't have to tell you to go get a cab. I didn't have to tell you to put a ring on your finger. I didn't have to tell you to put sandals on. They're, they're here, they're yours. Uh, you, you just got to know who you are in me. And a lot of times we don't know who we are in God. Praise the name of God. God has given us promises. He's given us uh, uh, his desires. He's given us the very things that he wants for us. He's, he's told us what he wants us to have. And a lot of times we don't even ask. He said, anything that you want, anything that you desire, you can ask of me in my name. That's what he said. Praise the name of God. The Bible even declares that he'll give you the desires of your heart if you delight yourself in him. Now I need you to understand, delighting yourself in God, because you delight yourself in God, it also means that uh, you're not going to ask for anything that you know that will grieve God. So a lot of times we ask for things that grieve God. You know, a lot of times we ask for things that are not necessarily good for us. And God knows this, but yet he still will reward us with what we ask. Just as the father rewarded this young man with what he asked. The father said, I'm just gonna let you Live your life, and as you live your life, and you walk the journey of life, you'll learn. There's some things that I can tell you, and I can help you because I have experience, but if you don't want to take my experience, I'll let you learn yourself. And a young man learned, and he came back, and he asked his father for forgiveness. And a lot of times, all we have to do is come back and ask our father for forgiveness. In the scripture, the young man basically said, you know, uh, there's no place like home. <laughs> you heard Dorothy say it on the Wizard of Oz. Many of you that's old enough to remember the Wizard of Oz and, and Dorothy wanted to go back home. She said, there's no place like home. I don't want you to get it twisted this morning to, to think that I'm talking about a house because I'm not talking about a house because the great prophet uh, Luther Van Ross told us that a house is not a home uh, unless there's love there praise the name of God and, and I, I believe that that in this day and time, there, there are more people at their house than there ever was before. Because of COVID-19 and because of the pandemic, uh, many of us have been confined to our homes uh, and, uh, and to our house, I would say, because everybody don't have a home. And, and we are finding that out because um, as long as we have been getting up every morning and, and going to work and our children have been going to school, uh, we find ourselves spending more time away from our house than being at our house. And now because of this time, we, we've been confined to our house. And many people I'm finding out or even uh, calling and, and, and I am talking to and counseling with and in counsel with, uh, uh, they're finding out that, that their house is not necessarily 
a home. Uh, their, 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 their attitudes that they were not used to, their different personalities coming out. Uh, there's, there's time that must be spent with one another, uh, husband and wives and, and children and, and even in-laws and, and, and even neighbors, praise the name of God, because everyone is confined to the space now and we, we cannot find ourselves uh, the freedom that we had with being able to go out, praise the name of God. And so, I'm not talking about a house. I'm really talking about a home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And, and the whole story is really not talking about the father and the son. It's talking about you and God. It's talking about me and God. It's talking about finding out that if we think that we can do anything without God, praise the name of God, and many of us have thought that, and many of us still think that, that we can do it, we can accomplish our goals, we can be successful without God. And there's many times that God will allow us to go through our journey of life and we can go through life thinking that we did it on our own. You know, after we get the nice job, uh, after we graduate from high school, after we graduate from college, after we start you know, in our career, after we get our education, after we, somebody tells us that we are intelligent, someone tells us that we are capable, and, and we, be, we really believe that we are doing it ourselves. Uh, but then there are some that really realize that God is in the picture the whole time. And that we can do nothing without him. And, and God will allow us to go through life and figure some things out. And, and I believe that right now that some of us is, are, are figuring out that where we are now. Uh, uh, and and we, we are finding ourselves in a place that we've never been in before. We're lost, just like this young man. And we need God. And it's very easy. Just get up and say, God, I need you in my life. I, I, I've, I've, I've made some mistakes. I've made some wrong decisions. And I, I need you in my life. Praise the name of God. And, and there's no need to, 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 to go back and Talk about all the things that you have done, but this is where I'm at, at now. And, and one thing I like about God, God is not like people. People will bring up your past, but God said, you know, I will like forget about your past. Your, your sins are covered, praise the name of God. When you receive me, uh, you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. And what does that mean? You are covered by the sacrificial offering that Jesus Christ gave his life, gave his blood, praise the name of God, and you're covered by that blood. Yes, you are. You're covered by the blood. Uh, and so now he no longer sees your sin, but he sees you, and he sees what he created you to be. God knows that you got potential in you, even if you don't know you got potential in yourself. Hallelujah. And all you got to do is just uh, yield yourself to him and he will use you to the best of your ability. Praise the name of God. He will allow you to tap into yourself, into him. Praise the name of God that you might be able to accomplish and succeed anything that he's put before you. Here to tell you that this young man, he said, ah, there's no place like home. There's no. And, and right now, I believe that, that many of us, praise the name of, of God, you know, we, we, we are trying to come back. <laughs> we want to come back to the house of God, the physical house of God, because we're missing the physical house of God. We're missing coming to church and, and being able to be around our loved ones and those in our church family, uh, to be able to be encouraged by them, 
whatever it is that, that God used them to encourage us. It might be through prayer, it might be through songs, it might be through dancing, it might be through preaching, praise the name of it, it might be through ministering. You know, we're, we're missing that. And, 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 and we are now confined to our physical house, our physical home, and, and we just uh, don't like it. We want to get back out. We want to do the things that we've been doing before. And I need you to understand now, for, for many, everybody is not confined. I want you to understand that. Ministry has not stopped. As a matter of fact, I, I just got back. I've, I've been moving, praise the name of God. And, and I need you to understand that uh, I'm going from state to state, and, and I'm saying, you know, uh, I don't, I'm not so sure about it because other places, everybody's not doing uh, social distancing and everybody is not carrying this pandemic and the idea of COVID-19 uh, the same way. I've been some places where I don't see anyone social distancing and people not, you no, know, don't have on masks, no gloves, and, and everybody's going back to their life. Praise the name of God. Uh, and sometimes we're not even taking this serious. But we're in a time now that the Bible spoke of. That, that, that every person would do what seems right in their mind. Praise the name. Can I say that one more time? That everyone will come to a place that they're doing what seems right in their mind. Praise the name. I mean, all the way from... Uh, uh, our higher ups, the president, all the way down, everyone is just doing what seems right in their mind. And we are in that place. So it, it is not just the COVID-19, it is not the virus that's just a pandemic. We are in a pandemic, we are in an epidemic of just the mindset of the people in the world today. Praise the name. And if we think that we got it, together, praise the name, without God, we will find ourselves in a place that we are going to be hungry. And just like this young man, he was physically hungry, but I, I, I'm finding out now that there are people that are spiritually hungry, praise the name of God, and, and, and they need to be fed. And this is what Jesus was saying, because when someone is lost, Praise the name of God. It is the church, praise the name. It is the church responsibility to help them find their way. And when I say the church, I, it is the anointing of God. It, it, is, it is the mandate of God. It is the mantle that God has put on the church uh, that we must find the lost. Uh, and we must help the lost find their way home. Uh, Praise the name of God. Uh, and, and, and I'm not, I'm still not talking about a house because a house, praise the name of God, is, is just a building. And, and a house is not a home if there's no love. You know, uh, growing up, you know, being successful, and I was taught, you know, buy property, get your property, and have a house, have land. And, and I need you to understand that uh, I, as I got older, I found out that, you know, because I actually used to, you know, kind of look down on people that wanted to rent all their life. But uh, to be truthful, when you find out that you don't ever own nothing. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. You don't ever own nothing. You might say it's yours, but you can't carry it with you. When you transition out of here, you're going to leave it here. And now uh, you might say, well, I'm going to leave it to somebody. I, I'm a, I got a legacy. I'm going to leave it to somebody else. But, you know, uh, if you leave it to someone that's in the mindset of this prodigal son, you know what they're going to do? Lose it all. Lose it all. And I need you to understand, we live in a place now, we live in a country now, that when, when is it going to be to the point that when you pay for your house and you pay for your car, that is yours? <laughs> yeah, I mean, after you pay it off, after you pay the mortgage off, don't pay the taxes on it and see what happens. They're coming for it. So it's not yours. You just, you born. Praise the name of God. But I mean, whatever mindset you want to have, because if you think you own it, you think it's yours, you don't own anything. Praise the name of God. Hey, so God is lending it to you for this time and this season. 
and you can appreciate it, and you can take care of it, and you can thank God for it, uh, but it's, it's not yours. It's the Lord's. Praise the name of God. That's why when we when people talk about giving and people talk about tithing and when church is talking about, about, about sowing seeds, you know, some people get upset because they really think it's theirs. They think it's theirs. That's why they get upset. But if you know that it belongs to God, praise the name of God, uh, what gives you the right to, to, to always have the authority to say what should be done and should not be done when it's not yours? I think that I would ask God what it is that he wants me to do with whatever he's blessed me with. Praise the name of God. And I'm not talking about what man wants you to do. I don't know. I'm talking about what woman wants you to do. I'm not, you know what I mean, because there are plenty, listen, there are times that even in marriages, uh, you have to make decisions. Your husband might want one thing and your wife might want something else. Your children might want something. You know, sometimes you can look at your children and say, no. No. And, and you don't have to give them a reason. <laughs> Praise the name of God. Praise the name of God. But, but, uh, uh, but you can look at him just like this man did and he said yes. Praise the name of God. So I'm not talking about a house. I'm talking about, I'm talking about love. And when you really find out, uh, you get into a place like we are now. There, there, there are people that's not really feeling the love. Now I need you to understand that there are many things, there are many, there are many things that have not gone away. They're still here. And, and, and there are people that are upset that they are confined at home. Listen to what I'm about to say. You upset that you are confined at home. Do you know that there are still people that don't have home? That they're homeless people. Homeless. They don't have a place to live. And you upset because you can find at home. God has promised us our needs, which is food, clothes, and shelter. Food, clothes, and shelter. And if you got food, clothes, and shelter, you ought to be happy. But in the world today, you can have food, clothes, and shelter, and people still get upset because they don't have cable television. <laughs> They don't have a cell phone. They don't have a pair of Jordan sneakers. They don't have the rims on their car or their truck. Praise the name of God. They don't have the car that they want. They, they don't have the house. They don't be, they're not able to live in the neighborhood they want to live in. But, but you're upset about these things and you got food, clothes, and shelter. Praise the name of God. And, and, and now you're confined to a place that you're finding out that you're not happy with that. Some of you are ready to go back, not just to church, but you're ready to go back to work. You, you want to go back. You want to send the children back to school. And, and there's no other reason than just selfishness. Praise the name of God. Because you don't, you don't want to stay at the house to let God make it a home. Maybe you need to be there. Maybe, maybe this pandemic came that we can refocus and find out what is important in life. Because the thing that we've been chasing after uh, is not really what God wanted us to chase after. Uh, what God wanted us to chase after was uh, uh, what he asked us to chase after, which is him. And if we chase after him, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. Now everything else will be added if we seek first him. Many of us have gone to the place that we weren't seeking God at all because we had everything else that we thought that we needed. Once we got money in our pocket, uh, uh, once we got an education, once we got a business, uh, and once we got to the top of the ladder, once we got on the mountaintop, uh, we forgot how we got there. Once we climbed the top of the ladder, I need you to understand, you can go up, praise the name of God. And if you forget how you got up there, praise the name of God, you ain't going to forget how you come down. Because the time will come. Don't any, nobody just walk around on a cloud all the time. 
Nobody walks around on the mountaintop all the time. And I don't, I, and I need you to understand, I really know that there are people out there that, that other people look at and they say, oh man, I would want to be like them. Uh, I wish I had what they had. But you don't know what people have gone through to get what they have. Praise the name of God. And, and, and I can see, when the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, it don't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. So, so that means that you love money so much that you, can, you will do anything to get it. Which means if you got to hurt somebody, if you got to lie, steal, you will do it just to have it. And, and just because it looks good and just because it seems like you accomplishing something, look, looks like you are, are successful, I need you to understand. You will look in the mirror one day and you will find out that it's all vanity. All praise the name of God. And this is what this young man found out. Now, the story of the brother, even though he was there in in the surrounding in that uh, same environment of his father, it is apparent that he still did not have his father's heart. I need y'all to hear that. Because, see, just because we're in church, uh, praise the name of God, and, and just because we can say uh, we love God, and just because we say we know God, it doesn't mean that we got God's heart. Praise the name of God. It, it, as a matter of fact, the prodigal son, when he said there's no place like home, he, he felt the love of his father. He, in his mind, he, he already knew that his father was going to forgive him. Ah, praise the name of God. And I need you to understand, uh, like, even with my growing up, you know, uh, there was a lot of times that uh, the, the teaching that I received, uh, the preaching that I received, uh, you know, I, I, I feared God. Uh, and I thought God was one that, that was going to just uh, punish me for everything that I've done wrong. And, and then I studied for myself. Huh? And I found out that I had a loving father. Huh? A father full of grace and a father full of mercy. Huh? I found out that men would not give me mercy. Huh? I found out men would not give me grace. Huh? I found out women would not give me mercy. Huh? I found out women would not give me grace. Huh? I found out people, praise the name of God, would turn their back on you. I found out you could have so-called friends, huh? praise the name of God, and as long as everything was going good, huh, they would be with you, huh? just like this young man. Huh? But when you find yourself needing help, huh, the very ones that you help huh, will turn their back on you. Huh? They'll forget what you've done for them. Huh? Praise the name. I found out that people will walk on you. Huh? People will use you. Huh? They'll use your capability. They'll use your gift. Huh? Praise the name of God and make themselves better. Huh? Oh, praise the name of God. Huh? They'll allow you to be the face of the franchise. Huh? And then once everything is alright, huh? praise the name of God, they'll forget all about you. Huh? Hallelujah. Huh? But this young man who wasn't talking about huh? any kind of home, huh? he was talking about God. He found out that there's no place like home because there's no place like God. His father was a representation of God. As a matter of fact, if you make up in your mind and in your heart today that I'm going to get up and I'm going back home because there's no place like home. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about there's no place like God. I'll praise the name of God. I thought I had it all together. Oh, I got a great ministry. Oh, I got a great business. Oh, I got a great career. Everything's going good. Oh, I don't even take the time to pray anymore. I just get up, get my coffee, pray to put on my suit, 
and hit the door. Oh, praise the name of God. I don't need God. I got me a set of golf clubs. I'm going to the golf course. I don't need God. Hallelujah, I'm going because I got me a nice boat outside. Pontoon, I'm going to get on the lake and I'm going to fish. Oh, praise the Matter of fact, I'm just going to get on the computer and I'm just going to pull up the Hallelujah Airlines. Praise the name of God. And I'm just going to take me a flight somewhere. Praise the name of God. And I'm going to go away on vacation. But I found out that every now and then, the Bible has shown us that when we get far away from God and we forget who God is, when we set up all other high places, God will bring them high places down. Praise the name of God so we can refocus and we can find out who it is we supposed to worship, who it is we supposed to praise. Hallelujah. We'll find out that you can't go to the golf course. We'll find out that you can't go to the lake. Hallelujah. We'll find out that we can't take a flight. Praise the name of God that all the gates are closed. Can't nobody go nowhere. You can't go to the restaurant and eat your favorite foods. Oh, praise the name of God. You can't go to the beach. You can't go to the park. Hallelujah. Somebody say, well, Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. I can go all these places. Yeah, you can go all these places, but you might be putting yourself in subjection. You might be putting yourself in harm's way. Oh, praise the name of God. I'm talking about walking around in a freedom and knowing that God has your back. I'm talking about going back home because you know that God is the great protector. He is our provision. I'm talking about going back to the secret place of the Most High. And I'm talking about abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. I'm talking about going back to a God that knows all and can do all. He's omnipotent. I'm their present. He do all things. He's El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God. There's nothing that I need that God doesn't have. Praise the name of God. I'm not talking about a house, but I'm talking about a home. I'm talking about God. That's who we came out of, and that's who we're going back to. Because to be after this body is to be present with the Lord. I'm going back home because there's no place like home. I'm going back because God had called me to be with him. I'll praise the name of God to walk with him. I'll praise the name of God to talk with him. Praise the name of God to give him my heart. Yes, he has. That I can tell him, hallelujah, how great he is. For the Bible declares he inhabits the praise of his people. And when you become his people, you ought to act like you his people. The Bible says that we are walking epistles read by men. We are priesthood. That's who we are. In other words, the world is dark and they're looking for answers. How you got an answer if you don't have God? Because God is the answer. I refuse to sit here and be hungry. I refuse to sit here and die. I'm going to get up and I'm going back home. There's no place like home. What are you saying, Pastor? Hallelujah. No, I'm not necessarily talking about the four walls of the church. I'm talking about your home. You are the church. You are the home. For the Bible says that Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? Praise the name of God. They begin to answer him. Hallelujah. But Peter said, you are the Christ. 
Christ. You are the anointed one. Praise the name of God in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Upon this declaration that you made that I am the anointed one. I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build my home. And the gates of hell should not prevail against it. I came by to tell you when you come home, you are covered by the Lord. No devil from hell can stop anything God got for you. Any place God got for you. Hallelujah. No devil from hell. Hell hounds might get on your trail, but you can keep on walking. Hallelujah. If the hell hounds on your trail, you can look at them and say, Hallelujah. I might can't fly, but I'll run. And if I can't run, I'll walk. And if I can't walk, I'll crawl. But I ain't worried about you. Praise the name of God. For Jesus said to the devil, Get thee behind me. And I came by to tell you, when I'm home in Christ Jesus, I'm covered by the blood. Jesus said, Get thee behind me. In other words, if I'm one of his children, that means the enemy is behind me also. I'm walking with him. I'm talking with him. Hallelujah. Throw me overboard. Hallelujah. And I'm not going to drown. Put me in jail. And throw away the key. And I'm coming out free. Why? Because I'm home. There's no place like home. I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going back. I'm going back to God. I'm praying more. I'm fasting more. I'm worshiping more. I'm calling him more. Plead my call. Here I am. I'm back home. I don't need a ring. I don't need a garment. I don't need sandals. All I need is your presence. Stay on me, God. Be on me, God. Anoint me, God. For the anointing destroys the yoke. Any yoke come up against us, it shall be destroyed. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Anybody believe that today? Anybody believe that today? You better tell them, I believe it today. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Why? Because I'm home with the Lord. There's no place like home. I oh, praise the name of God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I need you to understand. Praise the name of God. And I need you to hear me clearly. When we say there's no weapon form against you shall prosper. That is contingent upon the very same thing that the prodigal son went through. Yeah, it's contingent upon that. It's contingent upon inheritance. Yes. Because the Bible declares no weapons form against you shall prosper because Because it's your heritage, which means that you have accepted God as your father. You have accepted him. And because you are his child, the legacy will be passed down to you and through you and through generations through you. But you have to be connected. You have to be his child. So this morning, no matter where you are, you have a chance right now to come to your senses. Come to your senses. Come to yourself. And say, God, I can't do it without you. I tried. I tried. I tried my best. But I guess my best but I'm good enough. And so here I am. Here I am. I surrender all. 
And you'll find out that it's not you that to open your arms wide. But God's arms is already open wide. And he's waiting for you to come home. Because there's no place like home.